So if you're watching this video, it means this video has been posted. And if this video has been posted, it means that assignment four was posted. Uh, and it turns out that pretty much everything you need to do for assignment four is covered in here, except for some stuff that we know from before. So assignment four is actually not a compression task per se. It's a task in throwing away information using this thing, the DCT. It's also a task in taking the result of that and encoding it into binary somehow, using probably you'll want to use something like delta compression, um, it, but you'll use some bitstream encoding technique from uh, the, the lossless section of the course. And the idea behind assignment four is it's meant to be an incremental step. It's not compression heavy because the hope is that you can reuse it for assignment five, which is video compression, which of course needs a lot of image techniques, especially a technique like this. There are lots of other transforms that would work, but the one we're going to focus on is this one. As I said in the last lecture, we're, we're working on things on sort of a case study basis. What I want to talk about in this lecture is obviously I want to build up to that. I want, and that's going to require a bit of um, conceptual maneuvering because there's some stuff we want to avoid having to require of people. There's a lot of interesting linear algebra, for example, that goes into this. We don't want to pursue that too much just to the extent we need to because there's some people in the course that don't want necessarily to revisit linear algebra too much these days. Um, I don't know if I blame them for that. I love linear algebra, but I can see why in a semester like this we'd want to keep the, the set of required topics stripped down a little bit. So I want to begin by talking about transforming data. And I'm going to cover it with this, inter this sort of weird contrived example. It's an interesting way of viewing it. I, the Sayud book does something similar, and I really like the way that they tackle it. So here, what I've done is I've taken a set of um, temperature observations from the same day, but I don't care which day these each come from. I just care about the fact that each row is one day's set of observations, the temperature in the morning, the temperature in the afternoon. And um, these are from, all of these are from early 2020. And I have a larger data set that is uh, 365 of these, one for each day of the last, uh, of the year between May of last year and, and April of this one. Uh, and so uh, this set of data is strongly correlated. Uh, the temperature in the morning does have bearing on the temperature of the afternoon. For example, if the temperature in the morning is pretty high, it's more likely that the temperature in the afternoon is going to be pretty high. If the temperature in the morning is, uh, is on the lower side, so something like this, the temperature in the afternoon is also likely to be on the lower side. Not universal, so this example here, there's a low temperature in the morning and then a relatively high temperature in the afternoon, but there's a correlation. And we've seen already in, in the lossless domain that correlations are a bit of a nightmare for us. We've got lots of techniques that guarantee that we can reduce our data to its minimum size, but only if we assume the data is independent. And it's not independent if there's a correlation. So we already know that we, we've been using techniques like um, LZ schemes or RLE as a way of decorrelating the data, removing those dependencies so that our other schemes that we know can reduce to minimum information if they're independent can actually achieve that. Um, we have some options with lossy compression, even if our goal isn't throwing information away, but we're allowed to sacrifice a little bit. Um, we have some options that we didn't already have. But suppose that we do actually want to throw information out of this as much as we need to to reduce it to a certain size. Um, it's also worth considering that the ways that we have of doing that that are data point by data point can be a bit heavy handed. So an example being I could say I'll just delete one digit of precision from each of these numbers. You might notice that that seems to have a much larger effect on, let's say, this number than it does on this one. Because this number is now only two digits of precision, whereas 12.2 is now three. That's the typical problem with fixed point values versus floating point. Um, what we want is to remove information from our data to save space, which will, of course, introduce errors. But we want the errors to be spread evenly among our data set. We don't want it to be a case of having to take information out in an, in an unequal way. We've already discussed that in the context of sub sampling as one way to appear to spread the errors out evenly across our images. So here's the data set of uh, the morning and afternoon observations for every day of the year between May 2019 and April 2020. And what I've done to produce this is I've taken each row of this and I've interpreted it as a point um, with the morning temperature as the x-coordinate and the afternoon as the y-coordinate for the sake of observing the correlation. And you can see there's a, pretty, there's a pretty obvious trend happening there. As morning temperature increases, so does afternoon temperature. There are cases where the afternoon temperature is lower than the morning temperature. There are cases where it's much higher. But generally speaking, we have this trend. And you might know we could, of course, run linear regression or something to figure out the actual trend line, which is apparently this, 1.15 times x. Um, it's interesting. It looks as if there's more numbers above 
above than below. That's just a distribution thing. There's a higher density of numbers down here. Um, so that is the actual trend line. I actually computed it. And if we want to store this data set that we have here in this original form and we want to save space, we could come up with some ad hoc representation. We know that everything is only being kept to two decimal places and I could say, okay, every number is between 0 and 20 in this data set. So what I could do is I could store that to four digits of precision, so two before the decimal point, two after. So I could store it as 0, 0, 0, 0 up to 20 Point zero zero, and then I could map that onto the binary value 0 through 2048, and I could store that in uh, 11 bits, because 2 to the 11 is 2048. So I could store that in 11 bits in a sort of fixed point representation. And so that means I get 11 bits for this, 11 bits for that, and so each row is 22 bits um, per row. But the question is, if I'm allowed to throw information away, if I'm allowed to introduce some errors, even pretty obvious errors, uh, can I do better than that? Um, and so what I want to observe is the correlations make it a little bit difficult for us to treat each value because each value is, has some relationship to the value before it, so morning versus afternoon. But I can see the correlation pretty well here. What I could notice is that if I store each point as an absolute pair, then this temperature, let's say we'll talk about this point here, um, its x-coordinate is about, I don't know, 12 or something, and its uh, y-coordinate is about 10.5 10 point, um, 10 or something like that. And those are both big numbers. I mean, those are both numbers between 0 and 20. But I, And of course I need that. If I want to store all these temperatures, the temperatures go up to 20 and, and um, I guess just a, they go potentially up to uh, maybe 20 on the x-axis and 30 on the y-axis. So I need to store numbers in that range. The question is, is there a way I could change the way I'm representing things to reduce the range of one of the components? Here, both components have range 0 through 20. Or maybe this one has, has range 0 through 10, but ultimately they both have a pretty large range. Is there a way I could concentrate that range in one component? Um, what this is described as in the Sayud book and in the Handbook of Data Compression is what's called energy compaction. The idea that the, that the energy there is referring to the total dynamic range of the value. We want to compact that energy into one of the two coordinates. What I couldn't observe is that um, although this point here is, is uh, up by um, 10.5 and over by, by 12, uh, each point is relatively close to this line. If I look at how far each point is away from this line, the distance isn't very high. Certainly, to find the point, I have to go a certain distance along the line and a certain distance up or down, but generally the points are pretty close to the line. They're not as spread out as they would be if I store them in absolute coordinates. And so I might think, from a linear algebraic sense, this is just a basis change. But what I might think is, hey, why don't I store how far the point is along the line and then how far it is away from the line. And so I could just take the entire set of points and just rotate it down like this so that the line becomes the x-axis. Um, and now the reason we haven't talked about this so far is that doing a rotation is a numerical operation and numerical operations, even if it's minor, introduce a tiny amount of numerical error, rounding error, at, at, a, at a very um, fine-grained level. So if you have 16 digits of precision, you might get error in the 15th place. In a lossless case, we're not allowed to do that. But in a lossy case, we are. Even if we don't want to introduce too many errors, we might be allowed to introduce a tiny amount of numerical error. So this rotation suddenly is feasible. So what I'll do is I'll observe that this line is y equals 1.15x. Let's do a rotation to every point and just move it so that the line becomes the x-axis. We'll rotate each point around by that amount. Um, and so the amount we're actually doing, uh, just maybe remember your trigonometry. The amount we're actually doing is uh, y equals 1.15x. That's the, the rotation we want is 0 0.85 radians, arc tan of 1.15. So I rotate each pair by that amount. And so now this is where the, the line was before. It's this value 0 in my transformed coordinate space. And notice that my transformed coordinates, the x component still goes. This is how far I am along the line. The x component still goes from negative, um, I guess, negative 7 or so all the way up to um, 35. In fact, it's actually a larger range than the x component of the previous plot, but not by much. And the y component only goes from about negative 3.5 to positive 5. So I've compacted that energy into the x component. I've reduced the range of the y component. 
Now, the way I did that was with a linear transformation. Um, I have a few ways of viewing it. So I could view each point as just a column vector and then do something like this. And then I have, I use to perform a rotation, I can use this rotation matrix. If I view each point as a single vector, then what I'm computing is basically this product M times P. Um, just to set things up for later though, I could view the entire set of points as one big matrix where each column is one of the different X, Y points. And then I could multiply the two matrices together. So P, so M times P, multiply on the left by my rotation matrix M. And that computes the complete rotated representation of every point in one operation. The reason I want to frame it that way is because later we're going to see transformations that manipulate the entire data set at once, not just rotate each point. Um, this is the part where I'm going to we're going to skim over some of the linear algebra here. Don't worry about it. We just need it for justification reasons. Although linear algebra is great. Um, so I can compute my entire set of rotated points, P prime, using this matrix multiplication. If I want to undo that, if I want to, if I want to reverse the transformation, what I would do is I would say, well, I have my rotated set P prime. I have to, un and which of course is equal to the, the original points times the rotation. What I want is to undo the rotation. So I would compute this value, m to the negative 1, which is the inverse of m times p prime equals inverse of m times m times p. And as we know, we can reduce that to this. And the inverse of a matrix multiplied by the matrix, assuming the matrix is invertible, which this one is, ends up just being our original set of points. And it turns out that what's nice about this, the reason that I'm using linear algebra for any of this, is that it turns out this rotation matrix has a property, which is that it's orthonormal, which again is, is great. And I, I want to talk about that for an hour, but I'm not going to. That means that its inverse is just its transpose. So if I, if I um, flip all rows to be columns, then I, to compute this thing here, so M transpose is this value. So cos theta negative sine theta sine theta cos theta. This is M transpose. This is actually also equal to um, the inverse of M. And so if I have the rotation matrix, it's really easy to compute the inverse. And so I can compute the, I can invert the transformation this way. The reason this is significant is yes, this is math, like the computer has to perform a calculation to do this, but it's very straightforward. It's a very fast calculation to perform compared to a lot of transformations we could do. Um, if I do that rotation, I end up with this uh, transformed coordinate system where the x value ranges from negative 7 to 30 and the y value from negative 4 to negative 5, more or, or to positive 5, more or less. Now you might also observe, you might have looked at this earlier thing and said, wait a minute though, isn't this a good use for delta compression? If we know that the afternoon temperature is similar to the morning temperature, why don't we just plot, why, why don't we just save values morning I will call it M, M for morning, and then afternoon minus morning. So we'll compute it in a delta representation. That works too. That does compact energy a little bit. Um, and I actually have, I've done that here. So if we do that, it doesn't compact it as much. Notice that this one, the, the range of the X uh, axis is negative 7 to 30 and the y is negative 4 to 5. Here we go from x negative 5 to 20, so x is, doesn't have as much range, but y has a larger range, negative 4 up to about negative uh, up to positive 9. So this rotated representation compacts the energy a bit better. It puts more information into x and takes more information out of the second coordinate than this one. And the books talk about this, about how there there's a lot of um, uh, theoretical stuff we can do to demonstrate that a particular transformation has better energy compaction, that it, it stratifies the data better. So we actually have lots of options. This is also a linear transformation. Um, it's just that this doesn't compact as, better, as well as the rotated representation. Okay, so here's my rotated data once I'm done. And notice that we've got large x coordinates in a large range, y coordinates in a small range. Let's try this. To save some space, because I know that my x coordinates still have to be represented in, a, in some large number of bits, I'll use 11 bits for my x coordinate again, and, and I'll represent them as numbers from 0 to 20 with two places of decimal precision, noticing that there are no negative numbers in the x coordinate in this small data set. And then I will round, I will take my rotated y values and just round them to integers. So negative 1, 2, 1, 0. I just round the integers. And then I store the integers in 3 bits. I think this should actually be 4 bits um, because I have to store negative values. I think I missed that on the first pass. 
If I do that, if I manipulate my transformation, so here I've modified my data, I, I, I've conspicuously modified it. If I take this modified transformed data and I, and I try to invert the transformation, so I, I, I unrotate, then I'll get what I'm going to keep calling reconstructed data. Because it's not my original data, it's not really decompressed, it's reconstructed. I took a modified representation and then applied the inverse to it. And I get this. And notice that certainly here I've introduced a very deliberate error to everything. But it doesn't seem obvious where the error is. It's more diffuse in the result. And we can actually compare the original data to the reconstructed. So here, for example, 8.14 and 12.27. They're both off by about 0.05. Um, 7.88, 8.13. Ooh, this one's pretty bad. This one comes to 8.18, 7.87. So there's a bit more error in this one. Um, 5.11, 8.26. 4.79, 8.55. So yeah, we've introduced a decent amount of error, but we've stripped away a whole ton of bits. And the error has been diffused between both components, morning and afternoon, and among all the rows of the table, although some rows feel it more. And I've managed to get rid of about 40% of the data. Maybe I've managed to get rid of a bit less if I consider that I, I, was, a, I was off by one bit earlier. But I'm still down at least 30%. I've gotten rid of 30% of the data. I've introduced a decent amount of error. But the error has sort of been spread evenly among the whole thing. Uh, and the use of the transform also made it pretty easy for me to decide if I, if I want to modify the data, if I want to introduce errors to save space, the transform gives me an easier way of just heavy-handedly destroying bits of the data such that the result after reconstruction, it doesn't make it obvious where I took the data from. I still have tons of errors. If I just delete the entire second component, now I'm doing actually 11 bits per row. If I delete the entire second component, of course there's a massive error between the original and the reconstruction because I've deleted 50% of the data. I haven't even thrown it into Huffman coding yet and I've already gotten 50% of the data. I've already gotten rid of 50% of it. So of course there are lots of errors. But notice that here, to, to produce the error, I just wipe out an entire component. I don't have to, to surgically go in and modify the data. The result in the reverse transformation diffuses that error among all of the pieces of data that I had. So I could, of course, truncate or round the original data. I mean, I could just choose to get rid of uh, a specific amount of precision from each thing, or I could round it to the nearest integer or something. But it's pretty difficult to find a way of saving 50% of my bits and evenly introducing errors. So an example being, if I just delete um, half of the decimal places, so I delete two decimal places from this one and one decimal place from this, then maybe I've saved half of my bits. But of course the error hasn't been introduced evenly. Um, and, and so uh, using transformations is one easy way for us to view the data in such a way that we can choose, we can surgically remove certain details across the entire data set. And um, obviously it's a case of having a good transformation to use, and this example didn't use a very clever transformation. Um, but we'll discover if we have a good transformation, it's really easy to surgically remove detail. Um, so uh, we've already seen, we've actually already done this. We've, we've applied transformations already. Last In the last lecture, we um, took our RGB images and we transformed them to YCBCR. Oh, yuck. Put an extra space there. Um, before we subsampled. So we knew we were going to throw away information. We were going to th throw away color information. But first, we transformed to a different coordinate system where the loss of that information would be less noticeable. We want to apply the same logic, not to color specifically, but to detail. But to detail in the full image. In fact, we're going to treat each color plane separately. So if I look at the Y color plane, I want to be able to transform it in a way that makes it easy for me to remove details, to stratify the input data by something convenient to me. In this case, I want to remove image detail with the finest details removed first. I don't want to pixelate the image. I don't want to blur the image if I can avoid it. I want to slowly, fine, with fine precision, remove details to get rid of some of the information. If I just begin pulling colors out of pixels, like I like um, applying median cut or or palletizing the image, that's not very precise. It's the same problem as modifying this original data. I want to put it in a coordinate system where I can make obvious uniform modifications, like truncating the entire data set, as opposed to have to take each pixel and fiddle around with the colors. Um, and so it turns out that there exist transformations, like the one this lecture is about, that can separate, in a sense, stratify the image by detail, and then 
we can modify that transformed representation to reduce image quality in a way that's less visible to a human observer. We know that we're throwing information away one way or the other, but this allows us to choose better which information to throw away to get the, the maximum benefit. Um, and we can throw that, and which of course allows us to throw more information away before somebody notices. So then I guess we have to t take a quick um, digression, which is to talk, I guess, about, um, we obviously have a problem here, there's error. And clearly if I'm doing something like this, I can tolerate a certain amount of error. So how do we measure that? How do I know how much error I have? Now, it's hard because what does it mean to have error? It depends on the use for the data. So instead, what we're going to come up with at minimum, for the sake of having a rule of thumb, if nothing else, is a comparative metric. I'd like to have a way of globally measuring error such that I don't know what a good number is, but I do know whether a given data set has more or less error than another one. That's all. It's hard for me to know how much error I can tolerate here without knowing more about where I'm using the data. But I at least want to be able to, if I'm trying out different schemes decide whether one scheme introduces more error than another. So that's the, what I want to mathematically quantify. And this is another place where I'm going to just skip over some details because we don't need to go learn about signal processing. Um, you can take a different course for that. Um, so let's uh, take a look. I'll phrase it like this. I have an array of values. So I have s and it equals, we'll just number them, s0, s1, up to Sn. So the function S gives me the different values of some input sequence. And then I compute some representation T, so a vector T0, T1, up to Tn, that is meant to be an approximation or reconstruction of S. So we have to know for this uh, metric which was the original. So in this case, um, in this example, this would be S, this would be T. Uh, and so T is some approximation or reconstruction. What I want to know is, uh, what is the error? Is there a way of measuring the error in T versus S? And the metric we're going to use is called PSNR, Peak Signal to Noise Ratio. And the reason we're going to use it is because it, images, uh, for images and sound and things, this tends to be a good metric to use for um, measuring, to some extent, the error that we're likely to see in perception. Um, so if we define this quantity mean squared error, which is pretty much what you expect it to be, the uh, average of the um, squares of the difference between S and T, so it's mean squared error. Uh, the PSNR is defined as this quantity, which is equivalent due to the laws of logarithms to this. Notice that the logs are in base 10. It's a bit of a strange quantity, PSNR, but we're going to use it because we need something. There are actually a lot of other, for images specifically, there are measurements like this that we can use, but we just need something basic. We're not diving as much into the quality aspect as we are into the pipeline aspect of image and video compression. So the definition that we've given is actually, of course, a one dimension. It's for one-dimensional sequences. Uh, S and T are just vectors. Uh, we can apply it pretty easily to uh, a, an image um, and the reconstruction of the image. All we do, if you notice, w the only time we care about S and T is take a given value of S and subtract the corresponding value of T. That's easy to generalize into the 2D case. We just flatten the image out into a long array of pixels. We just take every row of the image and concatenate it together into one big array and then compute this for that. Um, if we want to compute PSNR for a color image, we have a few options. Um, usually, because we care about perceptual differences, if we're using YCBCR, it's often better to compute either separate PSNR values for each color plane, so Y and then CB and then CR, because there is a different value to human perception of the Y color plane versus the other two. Um, we could compute PSNR just uh, value by value through an entire RGB image. So in other words, um, we flatten each RGB pixel into an array of size 3, and then we flatten the entire image into a, big, uh, into a long array of individual numbers where we get you know, the red value for pixel 1, the green value for pixel 1, the blue value for pixel 1, the red value for pixel 2, and so on. We could do that. that PS, we could compute PSNR based on that, but we, we do want to accommodate the fact that the PSNR for, let's say, the Y channel, um, we want want that to be uh, higher than we want than the PSNR for the color channels because we know that people can see differences in the Y channel uh, more. So I'll come back to that later, but that's one way of measuring this. For the sake of today, what I'm going to talk about is mostly the use of PSNR for um, single vectors, and so it's not as big of a deal. <laughs>
Um, PSNR itself is actually dimensionless. It's just a synthetic quantity, and you can see the log in base 10. I mean, where are we getting that from? For some reason, we typically measure it in decibels because it's a logarithmic scale, and decibels are used as a logarithmic scale for other things in signal processing. Um, we need to be very careful about using PSNR as an absolute number. So just because we achieve a PSNR of X doesn't necessarily mean anything, but we can use PSNR comparatively. If we have two different compression schemes and one produces an image with a PSNR of X and one produces an image with a PSNR of Y, we could use that as a basic means of comparison. Um, another issue here, just like at the beginning I mentioned that the way compression ratio has been defined in our course is a little bit different than what I would prefer. Um, the same is true with PSNR. I usually like low values meaning good things. But here, a high PSNR is a good thing. We want a higher, the highest possible PSNR. Um, it's a logarithmic scale, so a difference of one is actually significantly, like going up by one is technically going up by a factor of 10 in whatever units we're working in, even though that doesn't mean much given that it's a synthetic quantity. So a high PSNR is good, but it's hard to decide in an absolute sense what PSNRs correspond to legitimately good-looking images. Although it seems like, as a rule of thumb, we sort of want 30 to 50 for high-quality, lossy compression of images and video. And in particular, MPEG, which is the uh, video version of JPEG, I guess, to, to be very reductive, the Motion Picture Experts Group has decided that they believe if you're, if you're considering a new um, trick to use in compression, if you can observe a PSNR change of this amount, point, uh, 0 0.5, then that's considered perceivable. So if you can change your compression scheme such that the PSNR increases by 0 0.5, that's considered a perceivable uh, improvement in quality. So, um, between this set of original data and this reconstruction, we have a PSNR of 35 decibels. Um, by comparison, if we do this one, which is where we truncated, we completely deleted the second component, the PSNR is 22. And so we can easily use the, the significant difference there to say, this is a higher global quality than this is. Uh, and that's the extent to which we're going to use it. We're not going to see it on assignment four. Um, assignment four, again, is incremental. But we're just going to leave this here as a bookmark for a way of computing PSNR. I'll post a program to compute image PSNRs later. So now back to this, the subject of transformations. Here's a function. In fact, I've told you what function it is. It's a sum of two, um, uh, a linear combination of cosine functions. Um, it's periodic because it's actually a waveform. And so it's going to repeat the same thing, you know, uh, infinitely in both directions. Um, and notice how the waveform is a little bit irregular. It's because it's a sum of two cosine waves, and so there's some cancellation happening down here, which rounds out this trough, and um, some additive. So there's there is uh, subtractive cancellation happening here, and then the two waves add together to sharpen up this peak up here every time. We know already, because we, we know the formula for the function, that this function is a sum of two cosine waves. And we can actually draw the two cosine waves. The red, so the f is a sum of um, the uh, multiples of these two things. Uh, and so the reason why that's significant is that uh, if we look at the waves, we notice the cancellation that's occurring. So this peak and this trough cancel to form this sort of flattened thing, whereas this peak and this peak um, add to each other to create an even larger peak in F. And of course, we probably knew already that if you have an infinite waveform, you can construct it as a sum of um, smaller waveforms. And that's the way that, if you think about it, that audio signals are represented as a sum of different waveforms. In general, if we have any infinite and periodic function, we actually have a finite, it is the sum of a finite number of sine or cosine waves. But that's not our problem. Our problem is discrete functions. We've got an array of values, uh, an array of a finite number of values um, that uh, is not necessarily periodic, although it might exhibit periodicity, which is why I'm getting to this example. So here is a discrete function, an, essentially an array of numbers. I've plotted it as, a, as, this, as this sort of um, uh, real valued representation, but it is a discrete function. Um, and it's, uh, we'll call it Q. Here's the problem. Give me a continuous function f that matches q at all of these points. And I don't care what it does everywhere else. So f can do something like this for all I care. No, I can't do that. Um, it can do something like this. Probably we want an interpolant that looks like this. But it's okay 
if it has some funny behavior, as long as it's one-to-one. -one. The funny squiggly line I drew a minute ago wasn't one-to-one, -one, so I went a bit too far there. Um, what we're dealing with here is, what's, is an interpolation problem. I don't care what my function does at other points. I just want to make sure if I evaluate my function at this value here, I get this value here. That's it. So it's interpolation. I, I'm trying to figure out an interpolant but with the unique constraint that I don't actually care what the interpolating function does between these specific points that I started with. Now, the reason um, we won't cover that later, we already talked about that. Um, so you can see the slides were designed in a funny order. Um, so uh, the first thought I have is, if you've taken CSC 349A, uh, you might know that there is a unique interpolating polynomial. If I give you any set of n points, um, or a, a, sorry, any set of n pairs, or any, any set of n xy points, I guess that's a set of n points, um, where all of the x values are distinct, which means logically I can model it as a linear, fun as a linear sequence of values, um, then it turns out that you can uh, derive a polynomial that matches my set of points at each uh, step and then does something predictable in between. Something nice and smooth looking too. If you think about it, this is a very pleasant looking interpolant because it sort of transitions between values in the most natural possible way. It doesn't waste energy between values. It turns out though that that can happen. We can see here the beginnings of some behavior where it's going down a little bit further than it needs to. Um, it also is sort of nice because it turns out that the interpolating polynomial exists even outside of my source data set, not that we care. We, we could use it for extrapolation to some extent. Um, we can write the interpolating polynomial as this set of coefficients, c0 times x to the 0, c1 times x to the 1. The reason why that's significant is that my original q was this sequence of points. So q of um, Q of 1 equals 6, Q of 2 equals 15, Q of 3 equals, I don't know, 17. And now my transformed representation is this thing P, where it's just a question of what these coefficients are, C0, C1, up to C9. We're going to see, though, that this transformation, even though really it transforms an array of values into a different array of values that I can use to reconstruct it, it's not ideal because if I delete a bunch of these terms, if I get rid of everything, let's say after x to the 1, and I look at the resulting polynomial, I don't get anything close to what I started with. So here I only use the powers x0, x1, x2, x3, and x4. I deleted all the other ones and it's just way off. It, I mean, even though I only, I only deleted half of the information, I'm only approximating one of the values even close to accurately. So this transformation doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work isn't, um, if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, it's not that surprising because if you look at these values, they don't really look like a polynomial. This set of input values, it goes up and it goes down. Certainly polynomials can have that behavior. This one with degree uh, 9 uh, certainly does have this behavior. But generally, we expect polynomials to go up and, or to go down. And the, the sort of the, um, the turning around that we tend to see out of polynomials is the result of polynomial of interference. But generally speaking, polynomials um, go to infinity in one direction or the other. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we look at this data, certainly the data doesn't look like a bunch of sine waves, but the data goes up and down, not unlike what periodic functions do. In fact, if we look locally, there are places where the data looks quite a bit more like a waveform than like a polynomial. Uh, and so it turns out that actually, if we have um, a set of n linearly independent functions with respect to our input set of points, we can define pretty much any combination of those, a combination of those functions for any set of functions that will interpolate a discrete set of points. So I have this set Q of points. I can choose what functions I use to build up an interpolant for it. I could choose to use polynomials like x1, x squared, x cubed, whatever, but I could also choose to use something like waveforms. In fact, why don't we see if we can do that? Uh, find a way of representing this discrete function using a linear combination of cosine functions, just cosine, not sine functions. And why I want to do this is what I just mentioned, which is that there is some evidence here of a little bit of periodic behavior in this function. It goes, it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down. Polynomials can do that, but that's not their, their home turf. Polynomials in general, we expect them to come from infinity and then go to infinity, or to come from infinity and then go to infinity this way or something. But waveforms go up and down for eternity. So here's one cosine function. In particular, this is the function um, f of x equals cosine of 0 times x. 
And we can see that, of course, that's actually a constant. So linear combination involving this will just be a constant. So there's one cosine function. It's not doing a very good job of interpolating the function. It makes sense that the best interpolant we can do with a constant function is just sort of the average value. Um, if I use two cosine functions, so I mix in one more waveform, I can get this interpolant, which is a little bit closer. So at each step here, the red function is the one I'm folding in, and the green is the sum of all the ones I have so far. I mix in a third one, I mix in a fourth one. Notice that the frequency is increasing as I go. So the, the wavelength is decreasing and the frequency is increasing. I mix in another one and another one and another one, and as, as I go, the frequency gets uh, smaller and uh, gets higher and higher, and over time, slowly, as I add more and more of these cosine functions, the green line, the sum of all of what I have so far, gets closer and closer to the real um, set of points Q. Now the reason this is significant is, unlike our polynomial representation, where it was perfect when we were done, but awful if we cut it off in the middle, as I add more and more of these cosine waves, I get closer and closer to my function. But even if I stop here, um, I think there's a note about this in a minute. OK, well, I'll, I'll just stop here. And, OK, so even if I stop at, let's say, four functions, that's not great. The green line isn't doing great. But the green line is doing pretty good, given that I only have half of what I need. We should expect, if I have 10 data points, I should need 10 cosine functions to interpolate it in general. Just like if I have 10 data points, I need a polynomial with degree 0, who's, uh, with 10 coefficients going up to degree 9. Um, and so even if I stop halfway, Okay, I have six cosine functions here. Sure, there's some error in some cases. There's a bit of distance there. But hey, it's actually pretty close on most points. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, the function exhibits the most periodicity around this area. And if I notice, the cosine functions get pretty close on those um, data points with only six cosine functions. But I can, if I want, get perfect accuracy if I get 10 cosine functions. It turns out this is a linear algebra thing that we're not going to worry too much about. If I have 10 points, um, 10 linearly independent cosine functions, or frankly sine functions or just about anything else, 10 linearly independent functions in a linear combination will be able to perfectly match my original points. So I can define, I can, uh, define a transform representation of my original function q as a linear combination of these 10 cosine functions. And what I would be storing as a result would be the coefficients that I'm using. So q can be phrased as c0 times the um, cosine of something and then plus c1 times one of the other cosine functions, where the actual values inside the cosine call is uh, just a function of x. Um, and so it's, it's fixed uh, with respect to, to those. And so all I have to do is, uh, changing the coefficients, I can change what I'm interpolating. So if the values in q change, all I have to change are these coefficients to change what I'm interpolating. The same way that if I use a polynomial interpolant, um, any polynomial interpolant on um, 10 points will have c1 times x, uh, c0 times x0, c1 times x1 up to c9 times x9. The, val the, the um, exponents on x do not change. And so with respect to a fixed set of 10 linearly independent cosine functions, I can interpolate any sequence of 10 points, uh, any, any vector of 10 points. Um, and so uh, the observation I want to hold on to for later is, I use 10 cosine functions, I can perfectly interpolate my original. But if I only use five, I'm pretty damn close. Now, as far as we're concerned, we don't care about the mechanics behind this. You can see I'm struggling to not go into horrendous levels of detail about this just because I like it so much. What we care about is this is a transformation where if we cut it off halfway, if we only keep half of the information, we evenly distribute the error. Some of our points have errors, but the error is spread out among the entire input. And in particular, if our input looks sort of like a waveform, the error tends to be pretty low. Um, it turns out also that, it, that if we were to, to zoom out quite a bit here, so here we are going from 0 up to 10. Uh, if we go from negative 20 to 30 and look at that green line, it, it of course is periodic. It, re it repeats at regular intervals because it's a waveform. That's just an interesting observation for later. So here's what I care about. First, I can frame, if I have any set of values, so let's say a discrete function g sub u. So what I mean by discrete function is it's only defined for a specific set of input values, let's say 0 to n minus 1. Um, I can define this transformation called the discrete cosine transform. And the discrete cosine transform is this function g, also defined for 0, 1, 2, 3, up to m, n minus 1, these values. 
where it consists, the values of capital G are coefficients. And those coefficients refer to multiples of cosine waves. And if I take that transform representation, I can run it back through the inverse discrete cosine transform to recover my original function. And to be clear, as long as I don't do any funny business like what I'm about to do, if I take a function g and I produce its discrete cosine transform, and then I take the discrete cosine transform and I invert it using this, I will get back the original function g um, in, in full resolution, assuming perfect real arithmetic is being used. The reason why this is significant, though, is that if I, the uh, coefficients, that the earlier coefficients, so if g of m, if m equals 0, m equals 1, m equals 2, those correspond to these waves with lower frequency. And the waves with higher frequency are the coefficients that are later in the cosine transform. And we noticed if I throw away a lot of those high frequency coefficients, I still get a pretty good approximation. And so it turns out that the discrete cosine transform is really good at energy compaction. It's really good at moving a lot of the information to earlier coefficients, which means if I manipulate the later coefficients, I don't see as much error and the error is distributed pretty nicely across my input. Now, there's a lot here and you're you're probably panicking already. There's, a, there's reasons to be um, uh, to hold out some hope here. We've seen the definition. I, I'm not doing my job properly unless I show you these definitions, but it turns out that the way that these things are actually used is pretty pleasant. There's lots of square roots and cosines that we have to take, but we actually can boil this down to a pretty easy linear transformation, which is if I want to compute the discrete cosine transform of a sequence of n values, it's sufficient for me to construct this matrix that I'm going to call C, and C is n by n, and the values of C are given by this. So element ij is either, if i is equal to 0, so the first row of the matrix, it's this. If i is not equal to 0, it's this. So if you want to compute a discrete cosine transform, just compute this matrix. And then you can, uh, if you have the input sequence and you interpret it as a column vector, so I've got my input sequence, I can interpret it as V, and V would be my values V1, V2, up to Vn. I can compute the DCT just by taking C times V with usual matrix vector multiplication. What's also interesting is the way we've defined this particular DCT, there are a couple of other forms of it that we're not going to use. The way we've computed this, it turns out the matrix C is orthonormal, which means if I've taken the DCT using this, I can invert it by multiplying the whole thing by the transpose of C. So C transpose times CV equals C transpose C times V. And unlike many matrices, because C is orthonormal, its inverse is the same as its transpose. And so that just gives me back V. So I compute the discrete cosine transform and the inverse discrete cosine transform just by doing matrix multiplications. So here's an array, an array of only three values. It's called S and the values are 6, 10, and 17. If I apply the DCT um, like I did over here, so if I actually use the uh, original formula to compute the DCT, so I compute each value, um, I, I compute the value G0, G1, and G2 using this formula, then I end up getting for my DCT this. So here's G1, or G0, sorry, here's G1, and here's G2. I can then apply the inverse DCT to recover the entire uh, input values S. Uh, I can also compute it by taking my input sequence S and framing it as a column vector, so 6, 10, 17, and then multiplying by a matrix that I compute with this formula I gave a minute ago. And so here's the matrix. It's pretty ugly, but I compute the matrix. I get a numerical value for each element, and then I perform this multiplication, so here's the matrix. I've rounded the values to four decimal places, but you can use your imagination. And then I get this. And you'll notice, so 19, negative 7, 1, 19, negative 7, 1 is the same. So you can always use the matrix. We've seen all the background. Hopefully it was illuminating, but we're focused on computing the DCT and seeing what happens if I manipulate it. Okay, so first, uh, let's say I take that DCT I had a minute ago. Um, and uh, so I'll take, I'll use the one on this slide. So 19.0526, there's a bit more precision if I need it. Um, negative 7.7782, 1.2247. Suppose now that I truncate or I round it to two decimal places. 
So there is nothing after 1.22, nothing after negative 7.78. So I, I have manipulated it. I, I have uh, modified the data to save information. <clears throat> if I take this manipulated representation where I definitely deleted stuff, so I rounded this to, let's see, I, I did round. Yeah, I rounded this to 0.78, and this, was, this turned into 1.22. I deleted some information. If I compute the inverse DCT, I get back the original sequence. So even though I definitely deleted information from the DCT, it doesn't show up at all if I take the inverse. So that rounding had no effect on the accuracy of my original. What about this? Let's take the DCT and let's truncate everything or round everything to an integer. So I guess this would become negative eight here. And then this would become one. Is that what I did? Yeah, negative eight. So 19, negative eight, and one. I round to the nearest integer. I've clearly removed a lot of information from the DCT here. If I do that and I take the inverse, um, this is not the original array. The original array was 6, 10, 17. On the other hand, if I round this, um, if I take this and I round it, so I'm going to write round to int. If I round it to an int, I do actually get 6, 10, 17. And if I know that my original array is actually integer valued, like I do in an image, then this rounding means I do actually have my original data back. So I was storing the DCT as an integer, and after I did the inverse transform, I'm within rounding distance from my exact original array. But that shouldn't, maybe that doesn't prove any point because obviously my original array was, was three integers. All I've done is managed to find a way of storing the DCT in three integers. How have I saved myself any work here? What if I do this? I throw away, so I still do the um, integer rounding, and then I just delete the third component. And the idea here is for compression, I just wouldn't store the third component. I, I, would, I would send you the DCT and we would both understand that the third component was gone. I wouldn't bother sending you a zero. The inverse DCT here would round to 5, 11, and 17, which is pretty close to the original sequence because, I mean, when I consider that I deleted one third of the information, I deleted one entire element of the DCT, I ended up with a, a result when I re reconstructed it that was only off by one in each component at most. This is only off, this is off by zero. This is off by, um, this is uh, off by one, this is plus one. It's only off by a little bit, even though I threw away one third of the information in my input. Um, now on the other hand, so the key observation is if I throw away the last component, I get something that's pretty close. What if I throw away the first component? Well, if I do that, this is, Garbage. I, I get something that's way off. Negative 5 instead of 6. Negative, zero, negative 0.82 instead of 10. 6 instead of 17. Wait a minute. You know, this looks a lot like my input array. So my input array was 6, 10, 17. This is off by about 10. This is off by about 10. And this is off by about 10. That's interesting. Let's just hold on to that for later. So the reason why we like the DCT is that, in a sense, this is a very non-scientific way of phrasing it, but if I look at the DCT of a value, if I have my sequence S and it equals S0, S1, up to Sn, and I have my DCT of S, um, and we'll call them D0, D1, up to Dn, if I have my DCT of S, it turns out that, in a sense, the coefficients are sort of sorted in the DCT into descending order of significance. Because these higher coefficients correspond to very uh, high frequency waves, they likely uh, affect very relatively uh, high detail changes between values. Um, whereas the lower coefficients correspond to much lower frequency waves, which can have an impact. And if we think about, like, you know, if we plot S0, S1, S2, up to Sn, the lower frequency waves are more likely to have a large impact on adjacent values, whereas higher frequency waves tend to have uh, a relatively less distinguishable impact on adjacent values. So what we care about here is that if we throw away the higher frequency components, we are likely introducing less error or less noticeable error into the original sequence. Keeping in mind that, for example, for images, the human eye can tolerate a certain amount of, of um, error in the image, but we don't want to have an, uh, the error that we introduce affect one region of the image more than a different region of the image. So I'll come back to that in a few minutes because I know that that's a bit of a strange way of phrasing it. So here's an example on a, an array of size 5. So I've got an array of 5 values. I take the DCT and then um, I uh, round everything to an integer and I throw away the last two values. 
So I've done, I've manipulated this significantly. If I compute the inverse DCT and I round it, I end up with this, which is, let's just write that up here, 41, 66, 76, 49, and 13. You know, that's a decent amount of error, but it does, I think, still capture overall the distribution of the input data. I've deleted 40% of the data, and I've introduced a pretty decent amount of error into each element. But ultimately, I still have the same basic um, uh, progression of data that I had before, modulo the errors that I've introduced. So let's go back to that example from earlier where I deleted the first coefficient. So here I have this three element DCT, I delete the first coefficient. Um, and it's pointing out that uh, the actual, um, we noticed already that it was off by a, um, uh, by a, what appeared to be a constant amount. They all seem to be off by about 10. Uh, it turns out that they're actually off by this number, 19 times root 13. And if we notice that if we add that back in, um, then uh, we get something that's within rounding distance from our original array. And the reason I bring that up is not because we should care about 19 root 13. It's because the first coefficient of the DCT corresponds to a cosine wave with, um, that is a constant function. And so if we think about the impact of that first coefficient, in my representation of the um, interpolating function, the first coefficient basically ends up just being a constant shift. And so it makes sense that if I delete it, I end up completely throwing off my values. Um, let's try throwing away the second coefficient. So here I keep the first coefficient and I throw away the second coefficient. If I take the inverse DCT, the result is sort of predictably off. But uh, I don't want to talk so much about 15 versus 20 or 27 versus 21 or 29 versus 23. What I want to talk about is let's take a look at the actual difference between them. Well, let's, just, let's just plot the error across the entire sequence. What I'll observe here, I deleted one coefficient. Remember that the DCT corresponds to representing my input sequence as a linear combination of waveforms, of cosine waves. I've deleted one of those coefficients. I've deleted one of those cosine waves. Let's take a look at the error. Negative 5.9, negative 5.32. The error is high, high, lower, lower, lower. Wait a minute, 9.3. Negative 9.3, 9.3, 2.71. Hold on a second. So let's take, let's pair these up. 9, 0.9, negative 0.9, 2.71, negative 2.71, negative 4, 4, 5.32. This looks a lot, if I had to guess, sort of like if I plot this, one of these. Um, the, or actually, no, I should frame that differently. Uh, it looks more like one of these. Uh, it looks a lot like the beginning of a waveform. Um, so let's, let's just hold, hold on to that for a minute. Let's try deleting the third coefficient. So here, I'm deleting this third coefficient. Remember that when I delete the first coefficient, I am deleting the effect of this constant shift on the, uh, on the function. When I delete the second coefficient, I'm deleting a cosine wave. The cosine wave is probably a wave of very low frequency, maybe one of those. If I delete the third coefficient, I'm probably looking at a wave of higher frequency. And if I delete it, let's take a look at the error. 1.8, 1, let's pair it up. 1.8, negative 1.8, 1, there we go, and then we get these errors of zero. It looks a lot like the error, the fluctuation in the error is fluctuating like a waveform. The error has periodic behavior. Um, I think what I'm seeing here is something like this, um, where the error starts at 1.8, goes down to negative 1.8, and then goes back up. Now, it's one thing that it's periodic. That shouldn't surprise us because it looks like a waveform, which it is. It, I've deleted a waveform from the sequence. What I'll observe is that if I delete one of these earlier coefficients, like the second coefficient, the error isn't well spread out. There's huge error here and here and very little error here. If I delete the third coefficient, I still get that periodic behavior, but there's relatively little error everywhere and it's spread around a little bit more, although there's still these cases of zero error. Maybe I'm lucky, maybe it's because of the waveform. Let's try deleting the ninth coefficient here out of 10. In this example, 
I still have periodic error. Negative 26, negative 26, negative 26, negative 26, negative 83, negative 83. But notice that it's spread out much better. It's lower, but the fact that the error is lower isn't as significant. It turns out that in general, the more periodic looking your input data is, the less likely you're going to have high coefficients later on uh, as a rule of thumb. The idea, though, is that the error is spread out more. If I delete or I manipulate that coefficient, the error has been spread out better. And that means that because the error has been diffused, it's less likely that somebody will notice it uh, when the only way they can detect it is by visual inspection. So it turns out that DCT coefficients at higher indices correspond to higher frequency waveforms. Um, manipulating these coefficients tend to result in errors that diffuse more broadly. If I manipulate a coefficient at a lower index, I might be manipulating an extremely low frequency waveform or a constant function. And of course, if I uh, eliminate a constant function's effect on my sequence, I could be shifting the entire sequence. It turns out that that first coefficient, which does refer to a constant function, has a lot of significance. Um, it's a waveform with frequency zero, which is why it's constant. Um, and if we think about it, um, we have this constant function, which is a constant shift, and then we've got this, this sequence, let's try and draw that better, um, of waveforms of increasingly high frequency. And over time, the frequency goes up and up. But the idea, though, is that that one very first coefficient is constant, and every other coefficient refers to some kind of waveform, um, some sort of alternating up and down pattern. And for weird reasons, I think I, I complained about this in a lecture earlier in the course, because of that, because the um, constant function is constant, it's called, that's not constant, it's called a the DC coefficient. That very first coefficient in DCT is called the DC coefficient by analogy to direct current in electricity, which is, which is a, a constant amount of current. Whereas the other coefficients are called AC coefficients. So everything but the first coefficient is an AC coefficient because it corresponds to an actual waveform, not unlike the waveform you see in alternating current in electricity. This is weird because it has nothing to do with the DCT. It's just this bizarre observation somebody made that, oh, it's like DC and AC. Um, we're stuck with it. Even the JPEG standard actually refers to the DC coefficient versus the AC coefficients. So we have to get used to using these terms. Um, but that's where they came from. Now, we don't want to necessarily go around deleting coefficients. Although, as I observed, if we delete coefficients, like deleting the ninth coefficient here, um, deleting the later coefficients tends to result in less noticeable error. So here I've deleted the ninth coefficient, and the numbers I get are really close to what I had to begin with, which is nice. Um, so uh, I don't necessarily want to delete them. What I want to do is economize on information. I would prefer it if I could store the earlier coefficients in more information because they seem to be more important, and I could use less information to store the later components. I don't necessarily just want to delete the later components, although it turns out you can delete quite a few of them before you notice too much quality loss. I don't necessarily want to delete them. I just want to use less information for them. I want to reduce their precision. And so the way this is done in a scheme like JPEG is with something called quantization. Now the term quantization is actually means a lot of other things as well. So quantization and compression is referring to this technique used in JPEG. Um, yeah, there it's being defined. Um, what we do here is we want to decrease the accuracy or precision. In this case, they're, they're related. I want to decrease the precision I'm using to represent each DCT coefficient a little bit differently. I want to have some um, precise way of doing that. Now, by decreasing the um, precision that I'm using, I'm also going to end up decreasing the accuracy to which it is stored. And we'll see why those things correlate in a minute. Uh, it turns out that... Um, this is actually mostly useful for things like, uh, I don't know, compressing a photograph versus line art because um, basically uh, the, um, the, the way the DCT has to be manipulated is a function of the type of data I'm compressing. So I'm trying to think of a good example here. Basically, it's if my, my image data looks like this, if I plot the, um, the brightness value of my pixels and the function looks like this, a typical photograph might have a, a brightness uh, profile that looks like this from left to right. Whereas a typical piece of line art could have a bunch of abrupt transitions between colors. And if I try and represent this function as a sum of waveforms, it's easier. I can do it with fewer coefficients, likely, because this is already looking pretty periodic. On the other hand, in particular, this situation, these are basically transient signals. 
it's very hard for a bunch of waveforms to approximate um, a, a harsh transition like this. So the idea behind quantization is I don't just want to go around throwing out coefficients because it could be that for a particular image, I need to fine tune which coefficients I keep and how accurate they are preserved. Now we already know that maybe we shouldn't use JPEG for line art um, if we're concerned about this. If we care about the crispness of the line art, we should use PNG, we should use a lossless format. Um, but the key here is that the, the type of accuracy reduction we want can vary depending on um, the type of image we're using. And so JPEG does offer the ability to provide your own quantization settings in each image. Now, uh, what I'm going to basically uh, get into here, I'm going to get into a 1D example uh, of this quantization process, but it turns out it's really easy to apply it to two dimensions. It's just a matter of using it, instead of using a 1D array, use a 2D array. Um, I also am pointing out that one of the disadvantages of a DCT is that I have a sequence of integer values, like for example, the values, the color values for a pixel. Um, the DCT is apparently arbitrary real numbers that could be negative and be fractional. And therefore, I at minimum probably want to at least round them to integers before I send them because I'm otherwise actually sort of increasing the amount of information that I have to send. So the idea behind quantization is not only to round the DCT to integers, but maybe do even more um, reduction of precision by dividing it by an integer first. So I'll show that off here. First, let's take some sequence of n input values, just like before. With image data, let's assume that our sequence is in the range 0 to 255. Um, that's, I think, a reasonable assumption to make for our 1D example because it's going to be uh, what we get for an image. Now I'm going to define a, what we're going to call a quantization vector Q to be an integer array where the values of the array are also in the range of um, the image data, except that there can't be any zeros, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, and also, we're going to assume that the higher the value is, the higher quality you want to retain for that coefficient. So if I have a quantization vector Q, um, which is 1, 2, 7, 100, what this tells me is the accuracy that I want to represent this coefficient should be higher than the accuracy for this one. So a larger number means less quality is retained when you store the coefficient. Then what I do is I take a DCT and I take the DCT coefficients and I divide each coefficient by the corresponding entry of Q, the quantizer. And then I round the result to an integer. And you might notice the larger of a number I have here, the smaller the integer I end up with is going to be because the, the, the smaller the value is once I'm done dividing by the quantizer. Uh, and then after, and then I send, and we'll, we'll see an example in a minute, I send the resulting value t to you and you have to reconstruct it. The way you reconstruct it is you multiply the value I gave you by q, which gives you some approximation of the original value d. So let's take a look. So here's S, uh, a sequence S and a quantization vector Q. The DCT is this thing, and so I take each value. So I would take, for example, here Q equals 2. I take this and I divide it by 2, and I get 55 point something. And then I round that to an integer, and I get 55. I take 22 and I divide it by 4. Uh, and then I take the result, and, I, and so 22 divided by 4 is 5 point something. I take the result and I round it, and I get the value 5. If I want to reconstruct this, what I would do is I would take each value and I would multiply it by the quantizer. So 55 times 2, um, I'll multiply it, so 55 times 2 is 110, which is pretty close to what I had before. 5 times 4 is 20, which is quite a bit off from what I had before. But notice that this is a bit uh, more precise than just deleting a coefficient. Um, and then let's try one more. So negative 5 times 8 is negative 40, which is close but not that close to negative 43. So oh, it's going to show this. So to decompress, I take each value, I multiply it uh, by the quantizer. So both compressor and decompressor have that quantizer. And then I get an approximation of my DCT. So the reconstructed DCT, here's the original DCT, here's the reconstructed one. And then I take the inverse DCT of that, and I get this value, which of course is going to be off. It's not going to equal my original sequence because um, I, uh, I've discarded a bunch of information. And so there will be some error. And so S prime is 47, 55, 74, 59, 11. So 47, 55, and that's, you know, not off by much. 74, 59, 
and 11. And so we can see, of course, there's error just like before. Um, the advantage, though, is I could be a bit more precise in which coefficients to attenuate, as opposed to just keep this versus throw it away. I could say, well, let's divide this coefficient by a larger value, which decreases its precision by more. Um, let's try using a different quantization vector. So suppose I use this vector where the d divisor for, for example, the first coefficient is a smaller number. Keeping in mind a smaller divisor means you retain more quality. And then I get 48, 56, uh, 74, 58, 10, which is a little bit better, a little bit less error. And we can actually take a look at the whole process with a larger um, value. So let's take a look at what the impact of different quantization choices are. So here's my input vector. Here is my choice of Q. I keep every coefficient up to, I keep the first seven coefficients intact. I divide them by one. The last three I divide by 30. So I, I pretty aggressively quantize the last three. So I take the DCT and I divide by the quantizer and round. And in this case, all I'm doing is rounding because the quantizer is one. And then for the last three values, I take negative 30, divide it by 30, so I just get negative one. Uh, negative, so 31 divided by 30 and round just, is just one. And then 30, uh, eight divided by 30 is zero. To reconstruct the DCT, I take the trans, so I, this is the, the compressor essentially. This gets transmitted and this is on the decompressor's end. The decompressor also has the quantization vector. So the decompressor takes the transmitted value and multiplies each value by the quantizer. And for the first seven, again, nothing happens. For um, the last three, we take negative one times 30 is negative 30, one times 30 is 30, zero times 30 is zero. And so we have lost some detail here, and then we reconstruct the data. And of course, there is some error. Notice that the relative error, so relative error here, um, you may know this from numerical analysis or something, it's the percentage of the original value, uh, the error in terms of a percentage of the original value. Um, the relative error is not that high for some values. It's pretty high for this one. Um, I think because here we're 30, 40, 59, we suddenly drop down to 20 and go back up to 50. And so this is a bit non-periodic. Um, and so we get more error there, uh, just like how way, way earlier when we talked about these cosine functions, you might notice if we only keep a few of the functions, the error is greatest in places where the data suddenly drops below uh, the sort of periodic data that we were working with, where there's a sudden non-periodicity happening. Now I gotta find my way back to the slide I was on. Um, so, the reconstruction, of course, produces error. The error is relatively low, even though I pretty much went to town on these later coefficients. I reduced them to very small numbers. So quantizing them will produce a smaller integer representation, which will be significant later. But it also introduces a lot of error. Um, on the other hand, if I were to aggressively quantize the first, so just to be clear, with the last three things quantized to 30, the PSNR is 30. Remember that high PSNRs are good. Um, if, I, if I instead quantize the first three coefficients, the PSNR is 24, and the error is much more observable. So the relative error is 35%, 19%, 10%, whereas in the previous example, there was only one case where it was above 10. So the choice of, a quanti of, the, of the quantizers is significant, and in particular, forcing the quantizers to be higher later in the vector tends to produce higher quality results. Um, I can still quantize low coefficients. So there's nothing wrong, like here I was setting all of my low order coefficients to have a quantizer of one. I'm still allowed to quantize them by two or four or something, but it's useful generally to ramp up from left to right. Um, and here I have a PSNR of 30.24, which is pretty close to the one I had originally, even though I'm quantizing a little bit more aggressively in the middle. And the key here is, if I do this quantization, the reason we're doing it this way is, look at my transmitted sequence. The higher my quantizer, the smaller the resulting transmitted value, which means if I'm using large quantizers, which means I'm having a larger reduction in quality, the transmitted values are smaller. And think about all how this makes it easier to compress them. If I take these values and before uh, transmission I compress them, let's say with delta compression or with Huffman coding, now it's way easier to do that because it's likely that there's a smaller set of values to work with. Certainly delta compression is, will be pretty productive um, 
on this compared to, for example, something like this. These transmitted values, uh, the magnitudes are too large and the difference between adjacent ones is too large to get much mileage. Whereas here, the values are relatively small, even though I'm actually getting a higher quality than I was in this case. So on assignment four, what, what, what it'll come down to is compute a DCT, quantize it somehow, you can choose how, and then find a way of encoding the result. Probably I'd say start with delta compression, which is what JPEG uses. JPEG also uses Huffman coding, but you don't need to worry about that for assignment four. Um, if I have highly correlated values, so here is a sequence of values that might be a sequence of 10 adjacent pixel Y values like I would see in JPEG, these are highly correlated. They're all around 100. They sort of jump back and forth around between 100 and 110. Um, for highly correlated values, notice how I'm quantizing everything by 16. I, I'm dividing every single value by 16. I get this transmitted sequence. I am transmitting the number 21 and then nine zeros. And you know delta com compression can make short work of that. What I end up getting actually has pretty low error. And the, and the PSNR is, is just about 30. It's pretty close to what it was in the previous example. Now, of course, it's different input. Um, but I can do really aggressive quantization if I'm working with highly correlated values, which we generally assume we are in images. In a photograph, we tend to, it tends to be the case that if I look at several adjacent pixels of a photograph, they are going to, if I look at one color plane, have pretty similar values. And that means that once I do this quantization, I've got something that I can really work on with something like delta compression or RLE or both. Um, here's some other values uh, here and um, I'm also quantizing these aggressively. I'm actually getting above 30 decibels uh, PSNR. Uh, so what does this mean for a 2D case? So it turns out there is a two-dimensional DCT. Here it is, have fun. Um, but uh, we can compute it using a matrix as well. So the way we would do this uh, is first we would represent our image by a, a matrix as opposed to a vector, like in the one-dimensional case. The DCT, if my image is an m by n array, my DCT would be an m by n array of coefficients. Just like in the one-dimensional case, if I have an n element vector, the DCT of that is another n element vector. Uh, and now we'll, we'll see in a few minutes that JPEG actually only ever does 8x8 eight eight DCTs. It splits your image up into 8x8 eight eight blocks. Um, we're going to talk about what happens if we do a DCT on the whole image but I would recommend doing the 8x8 eight eight, um, block transform. So we can do the DCT with this formula. So to compute coefficient ij of the DCT, you apply this formula to the image, that's fine. It turns out you could also compute the DCT using a matrix. If you compute that matrix from 30 slides ago, um, and you have a 2D array, an, an n by n array, it has to be n by n because of the way we're doing this. If I have a square array uh, of values and I want to compute the 2D DCT, I have to do this. So it's not as simple as the 1D case. I have to do two multiplications. I multiply on the left by my DCT matrix C, the same matrix as the one dimensional case, and I multiply on the right by its transpose. To invert it, so I have my DC, my 2D DCT D, to invert it, I multiply that on the left by the transpose and on the right by the original matrix. Now, it's worth noting that if you have an image and you don't already have this matrix pre-computed, it's better to probably just evaluate the formula uh, on the, to compute the DCT. On the other hand, if, for example, you're doing lots of DCTs of the same size, pre-computing the matrix uh, can save you a lot of time because matrix multiplication is generally faster than this. Uh, and it turns out that actually uh, in the case of JPEG, which just does 8x8 DCTs, you could hard code in the 8x8 DCT matrix into your code. And that's what I've done in my implementations. I don't even bother computing it. I just, comp I just uh, hard code in the values and then use them. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what a DCT actually looks like in two dimensions. This is all aspirational. I just want to give some context. So in one dimension, a DCT is a way of viewing a sequence of values as a linear combination of these cosine waves. So the question basically is how do you map that onto 2D? Well, what you're working with are 2D cosine functions. So I'll skip back over here. 
So here is an example, uh, for example, a 2D cosine function uh, for coefficient 2 comma 2 in a DCT, in a particular DCT. Notice how there's a dark region, a light region, and a dark region, and the same thing, light, dark, light. So it is just uh, overlaid uh, cosine waves vertically and horizontally, axially aligned cosine waves. There's the 4-4 version, so black, white, black, white, black, um, and then same thing here. And there's, uh, here's a, the 4 here, and so, okay, 4-4, four, four, and then here's an extremely uh, large coefficient, so um, the if we look at an image of this actual dimension, 500 by 335, here is the coefficient at approximately, I'm going to try and draw it on here, somewhere around this location uh, in the matrix, the coefficient corresponds to this pattern. And you can see that if the image is a linear combination of these little checkerboard patterns of different resolutions, the one with extremely fine resolution doesn't contribute very much to the macroscopic detail of the image. And then one last point about this, the waveforms that correspond to off-diagonal entries. So here, the coefficient at, at index 2 comma 2 of the matrix corresponds to this pretty symmetric looking wave pattern. For 4, 4, also a pretty symmetric looking wave pattern if you look at it, it exhibits symmetry. Um, if I look at off-diagonal entries, so row 4, column 2, the waveforms that correspond to those are stretched. So they're um, elongated in one dimension. And so what I end up with, basically, is this matrix that ref tells me how to reconstruct my image by combining together multiples of these waveforms. Uh, and they can be really fine, high-detail waveforms, these high-frequency, fine-grained things. Um, and so the idea is that, just like in the 1D case, eliminating the influence of this high-frequency pattern on the image is likely to result in less subjective loss of quality than eliminating the impact of for example, this. The contribution of this waveform on the image, if I, if I view the image as a sum of all the different waveforms, including this one, if I delete this waveform completely, it'll have a, um, so bright areas here would be uh, areas where the waveform has a high value. It would probably have more of an effect on this region of the image than on this region of the image. So if I delete a low frequency waveform, it's more likely to have a localized effect on the image. Whereas if I delete this waveform, the places where I'm going to be missing data are probably more likely to be here, or in the negative case, here, as opposed to in the middle. And in, in this case, it's hard to even quantify exactly where the detail would be removed because it's happening in so many tiny locations. So let's talk about what happens if I take a DCT of the entire image. So here's what I'm going to do. I take my original image, and then I take the DCT, and I keep every coefficient in the upper corner of the matrix, and I set everything else. Actually, I shouldn't draw it on the image because it's not the same as the image. I get, if I compute a DCT of this five, uh, 500 by 335 pixel image, I get a matrix that is 500... Um, the oh, 335 by 500 formally, 335 rows, 500 columns. What I do is I get this DCT matrix. Uh, I'm going to take, I'm going to keep every coefficient in the upper quadrant and set everything else to zero. And so I, I call that truncating the DCT to 50% of width and height. I am throwing away uh, three quarters of the information. And I get this. Three quarters of the information is gone, and I get this image. And if you glance at it just the way it's being represented here, it looks pretty high detail. We can zoom in. So there's my original image, and there's the DCT truncated. And if you flip back and forth, you might notice there is an appearance of a little bit of blurriness showing up in the middle. What I actually want to call your attention to is take a careful look. Try zooming in on this you might notice there's something strange happening there, a strange pattern. I like to think of it like the pattern of sand on a beach after the tide has gone out. So keep that in mind. Um, here is what happens if I truncate the DCT to 25% of width and height. So here's my DCT matrix for the image, and I truncate it down to this, 1 16th of its original size. 1 16th of the total coefficients are kept. Every other coefficient is set to zero. I'm keeping 1 16th of the information in the DCT. And if I look at this, there's the original, there's the truncated one. Now, in my previous case, in the original, I had this. In the truncated one, let's clear this. Original, here's the truncated. There's a tiny difference if I look at them right next to each other like this, but it's not very distinguishable. And if I just showed you this, except maybe if you picked up on what's happening there, it likely wouldn't be an obvious difference in, in detail. Here, though, if I truncate it to 1 16th, I, I notice some blurring, some pretty unpleasant looking blurring. But I, what I want to, and so that's not surprising given the amount of information I've lost. I haven't just um, 
quantize my DCT, I've actually completely deleted most of it. Um, what I want to observe isn't the quality loss, that's obvious. Notice the odd artifacts that I'm seeing here. I, I like to liken, not only is it blurry, this looks sort of like the surface of a golf ball. There's a strange sort of pitting pattern being created by the artifacts from truncating the DCT. Um, let's see what happens with color images. So this is a long description, but what I did here was I took the original image, I uh, transformed it to YCBCR, and then I did a 420 subsample, which means I scaled, I left the Y plane at full resolution, and I scaled the CB and CR planes to be uh, one, one quarter of the total information, so 50% in each dimension. Then I took the result, and for each of the three color planes, I truncated the DCT by 50%. So what I've done here is ultimately, I've stored one quarter of the total number of Y values, and a, in aggregate, one sixteenth of the total amount of color information. Because first I scaled the color planes down, and then I threw away three quarters of the result. So there's the original image. And there's the reconstructed image. So I subsample, I truncate the DCT, and then to recover that, I um, invert the DCT, and then I uh, scale the color planes back up. I would say this looks pretty good. You can see a little bit of a loss of detail in the middle there, but it looks generally pretty good. Although, again, if you look carefully at that, there's something going on there. Here, I've truncated the DCT to 25%. So now for the Y plane, I'm storing 1 16th of the original data. And for the color planes, I'm storing 1 64th. So there's the original image, and there's the truncated version. And again, it looks sort of like the surface of a golf ball. It's obviously um, lacking in quality. Let's take a look at the same thing with the fruit bowl. So there's the original image, and there's the subsampling by uh, truncating 50% the DCT. So subsampling and truncating. I, I can't see a pretty obvious difference in quality in this case. I, I think if you were to zoom in on the melon, you can see there's a, I can see a little bit of blurriness cropping up there. But given that, if we go back and, and take a look here, given that it's uh, one quarter of the original data in the Y component and 1 16th everywhere else, I, I am below one quarter of the original size of the image here. And I've lost relatively little subjective detail um, with this image. Uh, keeping in mind that this is not a very high resolution image either. If, it's, if I had a high, most JPEGs that we're likely to look at of this are higher resolution and therefore the tiny pixel level differences are even less noticeable. So uh, I can't see that much of an obvious difference in quality. Here I subsampled to 25%, a subsample and then I scaled to 25%. There's the original, there's the truncated DCT. So here I can see some blurriness. I can also see something funny happening here and certainly there's something weird happening on the edges over there. Uh, that funny, it looks again like the tide has gone out at the beach. Uh, and that's actually an example of the classic artifact from manipulating or truncating a DCT. I can see it happening here, and I can see it happening here and here as well. Um, it's an artifact called ringing. And the idea behind the ringing there is that it, it, it's to do with uh, the impact of removing or adding waveforms. So here's an original image that is pretty uh, difficult to compress with a t continuous technique because the actual waveform, if I look at the image, uh, the brightness profile, it looks sort of like this. It has an extremely abrupt transition. Unlike other images whose brightness profile might be up and down and therefore can be approximated by waves really easily, imagine how hard it is to approximate this signal with a bunch of waves. I could use a wave that goes down and up, but then I have to use another wave to correct some of that, and the corrections end up, I, I end up getting a waveform that approaches, usually you can view it as looking something like this. Right, uh, And so we have to use a huge number of frequencies to get that abrupt transition. If I apply this DCT truncation to it, I get something that looks very strange. I not only get blurriness on the, on the abrupt edges, on the abrupt transitions, but I also get some strange sort of ghosting effect happening here. If you, if you zoom in, you might be able to see this, but let's look at it up close. Um, Oh, here's if I truncate the DCT even further. So I truncate the DCT uh, to 12.5% of its original resolution, um, both horizontally and vertically. Uh, and so we can see there's definitely something strange going on. Um, in a sense, a sort of echo of the edge of that shape uh, proceeds outwards and then fades away. Here's the original, 
Here is the truncated version from a minute ago, and here is a high contrast version. So I, this has been deliberately manipulated to show off the artifact. This is an example of ringing artifacts. So what was happening is those higher frequency DCT coefficients in the original, before I truncated the DCT, they were canceling out the impact of this waveform. But then I deleted them, I truncated it away, and so the DCT is clearly using a waveform of, I guess it's probably, um, something like this, uh, and we can see the effects. We can see that wave going up and down as it proceeds away. The reason, and you might be wondering, why is it only happening like this and like this? And the answer is because in the original image, we had to use some sort of wave function to approximate this in both hor horizontally and vertically. And so there are waves being used here that are being truncated, but those waves are, are not, uh, we're not seeing the effect of canceling them out because there's no abrupt transition. So this is an example of ringing artifacts. You can also see some sort of like little square ringing artifacts spreading out diagonally as well. So the typical artifact, we, we, we like to be able to classify the, the typical artifact seen by each transformation. Pixelation is what happens from image scaling. We tend to get that color banding when we do color quantization. Subsampling results in color bleeding in those jagged edges. And if we truncate or manipulate a DCT, we get ringing artifacts, which this is a very uh, obvious example of that. But actually, if you zoom in on the pair from earlier or on these areas I've circled, you'll see a similar thing. Not quite banding, because we don't get colors tending to a discrete uh, band. Instead, we get this strange sort of alternating pattern that looks like waves, the result like sand on a beach, as, I, as I've said before, which is a ringing artifact, which is removing components of a DCT so that certain waveforms that are undesirable are no longer canceled out. So what's JPEG? We're finally there. We can talk about JPEG. What's JPEG? JPEG is, uh, unlike things like deflate, I mean, we, we spent some time with that RFC, that RFC 1951 for deflate, and it was nice. It was quaint. It wasn't a real standards document. It was written very colloquially because it was intended as a manual for programmers, basically. We liked that, I think. The RFC was weird to see such a document, but it was interesting. JPEG is an example of an actual standard, a standard of the International Telecommunications Union, of all things. Um, from the early 90s. And that means the JPEG standard document is one of the most dry things in existence, and it's not a fun read. I'll post a link in case you want to torture yourself with it. Um, even though there have been a lot of competitors over the years, a lot of much better schemes have come into existence that have tried to replace JPEG. JPEG has lived on because everything supports it and it does a pretty good job. And because it's such a weird, dry, formal standard, it actually has all sorts of features that um, nobody uses anymore. But here is what a typical JPEG image these days uh, has had done to it. We took the image and we translated it to YCBCR. We then performed subsampling. We can leave the image at its original resolution in all planes, or we can reduce the resolution of each color plane horizontally or vertically or both. I would say generally it makes more sense to reduce it in both um, if we're going to reduce it at all. So that would be the 420 subsampling. So we subsample each color plane, and then we treat each color plane as a separate thing, as a separate array of values. We then take each array of values and we divide it up into 8x8 eight eight blocks of, of um, uh, I, I don't want to say pixels, I guess it is still a pixel at this point. We divide it up into 8x8 eight eight blocks of pixels. We apply a DCT to each 8x8 eight eight block. We quantize the 8x8 eight eight block using a quantization matrix, not a vector, a matrix. And then we take the resulting sequence of coefficients and we perform a sort of delta compression thing on it. And then we take the set of differences we've encoded and we, and we uh, encode those with a Huffman code. Um, it turns out that the JPEG standard is full of all sorts of weird stuff that nobody uses. It actually has support for arithmetic coding instead of Huffman coding, but nobody ever caught on to that because arithmetic coding was encumbered by patent stuff when JPEG was invented and it's slow, and so everybody just used Huffman coding and nobody seems to use arithmetic coding for JPEGs these days. Um, it still supports it. You could still use it, but it doesn't seem to be widely used. There's also an entire extra bit of JPEG for lossless encoding, which does something completely different. Nobody seems to care. Maybe it's because reading the JPEG standard is physically painful. Um, it looks like if you want to store lossless images, everybody just uses PNG. So uh, to be clear, uh, JPEG only works with these 8x8 eight eight blocks. Uh, if it turns out that you have an image whose resolution isn't divisible by 8, 
the policy is, that is used is we just duplicate the last row or column of the image to extend the image outwards until the uh, image's resolution is divisible by eight. So that's what JPEG does. So what that means is that in any case, once JPEG is done, it will always have an eight by eight uh, set of blocks. There's never any blocks that are smaller than eight by eight. Uh, okay, so then it takes each block and processes it independently, and it computes a DCT of each block. That means it's going to compute a lot of 8x8 DCTs. In that case, I would recommend just hard code the DCT matrix in. You're only going to ever need the one, the 8x8 DCT matrix. So just hard code that in. Now, maybe I'll post the coefficients of that in a text file, but it's, it's good to be able to compute it, but just hard code it into your code. After we apply the DCT to each block, every block is quantized with a quantization matrix. In other words, we divide the coefficient in this position by this quantizer. We divide the coefficient in this position by this quantizer. So we don't do matrix arithmetic. We just uh, slap the matrix right on top of the image block and then divide by each element. Um, you're allowed to use whatever quantization matrix you want in JPEG. And just to be clear, we're not going to implement JPEG. On assignment four, you can implement whatever quantization scheme you want. Um, in JPEG, you can encode whatever matrix you want into uh, the JPEG image, but the standard does this really odd thing. Um, it recommends that you use these matrices as a starting point. It says these are good matrices based on empirical, uh, this empirical derivation. So they probably tested them with, with people or uh, test them against a, a set of reference images. And it points out, you know, you don't want to use the same quantization matrix every time. Maybe you want a certain set of quantizers for a high quality image and a certain set of quantizers for a low quality image. But it points out, hey, as you know, a lower quantizer results in better retained quality. If you want a high quality image, take this quantization matrix and divide everything by two. If you want a lower quality image, take this quantization matrix and multiply it by two. So you could use the same quantization matrix on a sliding scale to get high or low quality images. And on assignment four, I strongly recommend that. Apparently, this is a good quantization matrix. I don't know why. They derived it empirically, and they claim that if you divide every number by two and use that as your quantizers, the resulting reconstructed image is usually nearly indistinguishable. They recommend using a separate matrix for luminance, which is the Y channel, then for chrominance, which is CBCR, and that makes sense because those coordinates could behave differently. Notice that chrominance is quantized really aggressively. Almost all of the matrix is just 99s. And if you think about the fact that the chroma values are between 0 and 255, that means almost every value in this part of the matrix gets encoded as 0, 1, or 2. Um, the standard in typical form for an international telecommunication standard says these are great matrix, ma matrices. They're derived empirically, nearly indistinguishable from the source image. But to, but to cover, they then say these tables are provided as examples only and are not necessarily suitable for any particular application. So there you go. Your mileage may vary. Um, I like the deflate document better. The JPEG standard is just no fun. Um, in any case, I would say it makes sense if, when you're starting out at least, just hard code one particular quantization matrix and to vary quality, as you have to do in assignment four, to allow variable quality, just multiply the quantization matrix by different things. If you want higher quality, then multiply it by 0.5 and then round to an integer and then use those as the quantizers. If you want lower quality, multiply it by two, which gives you larger quantizers. Or, I don't know, multiply it by 1.5 or something. Uh, and that's what that says. Um, now, after quantization, we have this issue, which is that we've got this matrix of coefficients, an 8 by 8 matrix. Okay, so how do we store the matrix? Do we just go row by row? We store all of row 1, then all of row 2? So we could do that. Um, JPEG does this thing. I know this is tempting to think about this as like uh, the JPEG version of that horrible thing deflate does with the code length code lengths, the funny reordering. This is actually pretty rational, which is that JPEG encodes the matrix like this. It starts with the DC coefficient, and um, I'll get to that in a minute, but it encodes the DC coefficient, and then it encodes the rest of the coefficients in this zigzag order. So it goes like this, and then like this, and then like this. And the idea being, if it encodes the coefficients in that order, each coefficient is more likely to be similar to the previous one. 
and of a similar magnitude. They'll get smaller and smaller as you go because the quantizers tend to get larger and larger as you go diagonally through the matrix. And so we use this zigzag order. And I recommend trying this out. I know it's an extra step, but it's not that tough. And uh, you can go get the exact coefficient matrix easily off of the internet. So it's, it, it, it's not like you have to, or you can type it in. It's an eight by eight matrix. It shouldn't be a big deal. Um, but basically by storing it in this order, we produce a linear sequence that tends to be easier to compress. The sequence is then compressed with a predictive delta compression scheme. So go take a look at that topography lecture for inspiration there. Um, and uh, it stratifies the coefficient by their distance from the DC coefficient. And the reason that's helpful, but it also not only does that, like we could do that by storing the matrix like this, stratifying it like this. The reason we go in zigzag order, like we go from one down to two, and then from two to three, and then three up to five, is that each element we store is close to in the matrix the previous element that we stored. We, we maintain some amount of locality. Um, JPEG does a bunch of other really hideous things that we're not going to worry about. One of them is you actually use two Huffman codes, one for the DC coefficient and one for the AC coefficients. Um, the other thing is because the DCT values can vary wildly, they can be like negative 1000 or positive 1000, um, what they do is instead of just using Huffman codes for the actual DCT coefficients, JPEG uses this symbol offset representation. You might remember that in deflate, we would turn a length, like the length 1000, 2040 into a combination of like a length symbol, I don't know, 263, and then a bunch of bits, uh, an offset. JPEG does something similar uh, with its Huffman coding. It only actually, in, it, it translates each coefficient into a combination of a symbol and an offset. Then it encodes the symbol with the Huffman code and it just encodes the offset directly. I was a bit surprised by that because it feels like they could, they actually might be wasting some space by doing that. Um, they get so much out of quantization that they, they clearly do just fine. I would not recommend doing this on assignment four. I'd say on assignment four, see if you can get a linear sequence of coefficients, maybe the zigzag order, I don't know, and just use basic delta compression for it. Uh, maybe with like a unary representation of the delta values, not unlike what we did in the topography lecture. Uh, we don't need to uh, necessarily compact things too well in assignment four. It's about getting a DCT and an inverse DCT to work. Um, so we're not going to try and duplicate JPEG. We don't have time or patience for that. What we want is to get a full pipeline for lossy compression. So in assignment four, you're provided with um, a uh, program that reads an image. It converts it to YCBCR and it subsamples it. All you have to do is perform some kind of DCT and encode the result. As I said, I strongly recommend delta compression for that. And then you write a decompressor that does everything in reverse. And we're gonna take that and pivot that into assignment five, which will take a sequence of image, a video file, and encode that into a video stream, ideally with real-time performance, but uh, we'll see.